John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his own one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This morning we light three candles. In a world where darkness abounds, the light of the first candle radiates the hope of God's unfailing promise. As we light the second candle, we long for God's perfect peace to calm our souls and end our wars. As we light the third candle, we seek to share with others the love God has shown through the gift of Jesus Christ. In a world torn asunder by violence, Jesus says, no more. Please join us. As it As is written, a new command I give, love one another as I have loved you. For any who are anxious about the worries of tomorrow, As it is written, a new command I give, love one another as I have loved you. For any whose lips have been silenced. As it is written, a new command I give, love one another as I have loved you. Let us pray. Gracious God, Scripture says we love because you first loved us. We confess that too often we fail to love others the way you love us. With our eyes fixed upon you, help us to love others in the manner you love us. We pray this in the name of your Heavenly Father. Amen.
Lord, you take my breath away. And I am grateful that you are a good, good father, that you love us. Even when I don't love myself, you still love me. Like the word says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall live and not perish. And we celebrate that now, this time of year. But you came even as a little baby in a manger with cows and who knows what else. We thank you, Lord, for loving us that much. every Christmas and it can slip by us so quickly but that very last line is so important be near me Lord Jesus I ask fit for all of us. But God can do it. Let's sing, bless all. Bless all the dear children It is uh, truly a privilege to be with you this morning, and uh, I do appreciate being invited by, uh, by the pastor and the staff to bring God's Word to you. But before I do that this morning, I uh, did Pastor Jack leave? Oh, there you are, right there. I was sitting in your seat. I'm sorry. I also want to uh, add to everything else that has been said. Uh, I, Jack started a church here in the Denver area at the same time I came into the district. It was 1993, so I've known Jack for 
nearly three decades. And uh, we have pastored alongside one another in the district. And then when I came into this position in 1999, I got to know Jack even better because uh, he became my boss. <laughs> he was on the uh, district board uh, and basically uh, the district board oversees the, the district superintendent. And what I've come to know particularly about Jack and Sharon, um, this is something that my wife and I talked about often in our staff meetings because she was my assistant. <laughs> and uh, two things that really come to mind. He is a true shepherd. He has a shepherd's heart. Now, overseeing 80 churches in the district, I can tell you that different pastors have different gifts, different temperaments. But this guy just loves the people of God. And it's his heart and his desire to serve the people of God. And I so appreciate that. That's, that's not true of all of our pastors. Uh, a lot of them are academians or they have other gifts, but this guy is a shepherd. The other thing that really impresses me about him is he is very careful never to say anything negative about anyone. And I, <laughs> I, I will even, because I'm impish, I'll kind of poke the bear and I'll try to see if I can lead him, and he will not say anything negative about, that's just, that's a, a, a high value that he has. And, and you, dear lady, are always smiling, always. I, I, even, even when you're sharing prayer requests that break your heart, you're smiling, and, and thank you for that. Thank you for that joy that you bring. Well, this has been an interesting year. <laughs> to say the least, hasn't it? A tough year, a year of challenge. Often we use a phrase, a metaphor, when we have difficulties in life and we talk about a storm of life that we're going through. Well, if, if 2020 hasn't been a storm of life for you, you just have not been paying attention. COVID certainly, I mean, in the church, in the body of Christ, among believers, we are even divided over a simple piece of cloth, aren't we? Wear it, don't wear it, meet for church, don't meet for I mean, we can't even agree on that. And I suspect that you've had other challenges as well. COVID, maybe some of you have, have been ill. Maybe some of you have uh, gone through financial challenge because of this. Maybe some of you have through family. I, this has been a year where there have been some storms of life, haven't there? Open our Father's Word, if you would, to Matthew chapter 8. This morning we're going to consider both a figurative as well as a literal storm of life. In Matthew chapter 8, in verse 23, the narrative is continuing from earlier in the passage, and it talks about Christ getting into a boat, and his disciples are following him. And as we go through this passage, there's a storm that's going to take place. And as I consider the, the literal storm, as well as the figurative storm, I see several things. I see especially four things in the storms of life. And the first one is, God knows about our storms even before they're going to happen. And he, he, he even leads us into the storms. It, it, the storms aren't a surprise to him, and, and he invites us into them. Isn't that a little odd? It says that his disciples are following him, and he, he, he gets in the boat, and they follow him. In one of the other gospels, uh, that gospel uh, writer renders it this way. He remembers it as Jesus saying, come, let us cross to the other side. And they get into the boat, they follow him. And they are about to go on a cruise of a lifetime, but not in a positive way. How many of you have ever been on a cruise? Anybody here? Oh, several of you have been on a cruise. Okay. So what's that like? When they advertise the cruise, isn't that one of the advertisements that you, you're going to go on a cruise of a lifetime, right? And you're thinking, this is going to be positive, right? 
They advertise it with, oh, there are six swimming pools and 14 buffets and all kinds of shows. What they don't say is, you're about to step onto a metal Petri dish where you're going to meet 2,000 new people who have communicable diseases going through the buffet line before you. Please enjoy. (laughs) You're getting on a metal ship and you're going into the middle of an ocean. What could go wrong? Jesus doesn't tell his disciples about the cruise they're about to be in an adventure with him on, but he leads them into it. He knows about it. He welcomes it. Now, let me give you a background regarding this passage. Earlier in chapter 8, earlier in the day, the day starts out with the Lord ministering to people. And as he's ministering to people, lepers are brought to him, and he heals them. Paralytics are brought to him, and he heals them. He even heals Peter's mother-in-law. I'm not sure how Peter felt about that, positive or negative. But now, when you are literally healing people, that gets other people's attention, right? Now, when you see somebody who is doing great and wonderful things like this, you kind of want to associate with them, don't you? In fact, that's what happens. People start gathering around him and they're saying, Master, we will follow you anywhere. And he says, great, join me. But by the way, foxes have holes in which to live and the birds of the air have nests in which to live, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I'm homeless, join me. And by the end of the day, they said, "Ah, we're not too sure we want to sign up for that. And by the time we get to verse 23, it's just the 12 disciples. And if I'd been one of those disciples, and he would have said, by the way, as we cross to the other side, there's going to be a storm, and you're going to fear for your life. I think I would have said, thank you, Jesus. I'll walk around. I'll meet you on the other side. The disciples had no idea. They were experienced fishermen. They knew the Sea of Galilee, and they thought, it's evening. What could go wrong? They get in the boat. They follow him. He leads them into the storm. He knows about our storm. The second thing I notice in this passage is he's not overwhelmed by our storm. Not only is it not a surprise to him, it's not something that overwhelms him. It says in verse 24, a a great storm came upon the sea so that the boat was covered with waves. And you see a picture there on the screen of uh, an artist's uh, depiction of this. Now, the word great here in the original language is seismos. And we have actually transliterated that word into English to describe an instrument that measures the movement of earth. It's called a seismograph. Jim Reardon lived on the San Andreas Fault. He lived literally, what, a couple of feet from it? Right on it. Wasn't that fun? It was a very shaking. Yeah. So this word seismos talks about great movement of the earth. In fact, it's used multiple times in Scripture. It always refers to an earthquake, except in this passage. This is the only place in Scripture where it refers to a great storm. So you get the idea that Matthew's trying to give us this picture of, this this is a big deal. The waves are covering the boat, and the disciples understand that uh, they're, they're possibly going to die. This boat is going to capsize. Now, let me paint the picture for you. The boat is approximately 27 feet long and seven and a half feet wide. And you're saying, Greg, how do you know that? And my answer is, I am very old and I was there. And I No, that's not, that's not what happened. We know this because in 1985, there was a drought in Israel, so much so that uh, Lake Tiberias, you know it as the Sea of Galilee, receded to the point 
where you could walk out onto the lake bottom. And as they did that, they discovered a lot of artifacts, one of them being a, a fishing vessel that was kind of sticking out of the mud. This was excavated, it was studied, and this fishing vessel dates back to the first century A.D. If you go on a tour in Israel today, there's a museum in which they show the actual structure that they have excavated, and they tell you the story of it. Was it the boat that Jesus was in? Well, we don't know, but it was probably very similar, because they were all uh, similar in that time. Now, the lake is... Th- miles long, seven miles wide, and it's 690 feet below sea level. That's significant because it's surrounded by mountains, which creates an interesting weather pattern, very similar to what we have on the Front Range. You live here 5,000 feet below the mountains that are just to the west of here. So what happens during the daytime when the sun comes and heats up the air? We get, these, we get great turbulence. Have you ever flown into DIA? There's a reason that the air is as turbulent as it is. Sea of Galilee is just like that. In the middle of the day, because of the topography, they w- it wasn't unusual to have big storms even without any rain because of the difference in elevation between the lake and the mountains surrounding it. So they fish early in the morning. They fish late in the afternoon or early evening, even to this day, but not in the middle of the day. If you do it in Israel, you'll probably go on a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. You probably will not do it at 1 p.m. because there's the fear of storms. So that's the situation that's going, that's taking place And and they realize it's evening, they're crossing, they're thinking it's safe. You know, we're we're not going to have the turbulence that we have during the day. But they did. And as it happens, it says, Jesus was asleep. (laughs) Wait, what? These guys are fearing for their life. The boat's being tossed back and forth. Waves are coming over it. And Jesus is asleep. How could he sleep through this? Have you ever been talking to somebody and they fell asleep while you were talking to them? Because if that hasn't happened to you, you've never preached a sermon. (laughs) When I meet people for the first time and they say, what is it you do? I tell them I'm an anesthesiologist. (laughs) And I don't even use drugs. It's a gift. Some people can sleep through anything. I have a daughter, I have two daughters, my youngest daughter is one of those people. Uh, When we were younger and they were children, because I was a pastor, we went on camping vacations. We didn't tour Europe because we just didn't have that kind of funding. So we explained to them camping is much better than touring the world. And we had this pop-up tent camper. Now, (laughs) those of you who aren't familiar with pop-up tent campers, they pop up and you've got this structure and the canvas goes out. You pull out two four by eight sheets that they assure us are are our bed and they have on them, they call it a mattress, but it isn't really. And my wife would, would sleep on, my wife and I would sleep on one wing and Tiffany and Laura would sleep on the other wing. One morning I awakened to the shriek of my wife where she yelled, where's Laura? And I awakened and I looked across and I saw that Laura was not on the other side of the tent camper. Being a caring father and dutiful husband, I immediately leapt out, leapt up, ran out of the camper, ran back into the camper realizing I didn't have clothes on, ran out of the camper again, and I found Laura lying on the ground four feet below this little wing, somehow in the middle of the night. This is still a family dispute as to whether she rolled out on her own or Tiffany pushed her. We aren't sure yet, but fell four feet, didn't even wake up. Some people could, how could he sleep through this storm? In this passage, we see remarkably both the humanity of Jesus and the deity of Jesus. The humanity of Jesus is, he'd had a long day. And it was emotional, and it was draining. 
When you're healing people, that kind of takes it out of you. And then when they say, we'll follow you, and you tell them the situation and they reject you, eh, they're not interested. He was human, and he was tired, and he was weary. Let's cross to the other side. You guys guide the boat. I'm going to take a nap. How could he sleep through it? Because Jesus has full faith and assurance in the protection of his Father. He isn't overwhelmed by the storms of life that we go through. And when they hit us, whether it's COVID or loss of a spouse or a teenager that runs off or a financial problem or he's not overwhelmed. He just isn't. Third, he's present in our storm. Have you ever asked the question in a difficult time, God, where are you? What are you doing? I was having a conversation two days ago with a young officer, Monument Police Department, and he and his wife are going through some just horrific times. Uh, not just COVID has hit their family, but she's had a miscarriage this year, and there are some other uh, challenges that I'm not even free to share with you. This was a conversation two days ago, and he said, she's questioning whether there's even a God. Sometimes we get to that point. You know, if you're really there, why, why is this happening? Have you ever doubted that he's present in the middle of your storm? That he's paying attention at all? I wasn't raised in a Christian home, and I became a believer, a Christian, a follower of Jesus through a very traumatic experience that happened in the middle of my teenage years. And uh, as I became a believer, I started sharing the Lord with everybody I could. I had a step cousin, and I, I wanted him to understand what I had just learned, that there's a God who is crazy in love with us so much so that he would do anything to reconcile us in relationship with him, in fact, has, through the person of his son, Jesus Christ, the one that we celebrate at this time of year. And my step-cousin would have nothing to do with it. Didn't want to hear it. One day we were hiking in the Sierra Nevada, and uh, if you know anything about the Sierras, uh, granite cliffs, and uh, we were hiking, and we saw this granite cliff and we thought we could see the top of it. It looked like a plateau. We're two teenage boys. And we're thinking, yeah, let's climb that. What could go wrong? And we had no experience. It was like a rock climbing wall, sheer cliff. We had no equipment, but what could go wrong? So we start climbing this thing. We get to what we thought was the top. It turns out it's not a plateau on the top. It's a very steep grade that we couldn't see, and it has decomposed granite on it. So that we're trying to scramble up this riprap, and my step cousin starts to slide towards the edge of the cliff, and he cries out, I'm not ready to die. At which point I thought it would good, be a good opportunity for a theological conversation. <laughs> C.S. Lewis, a 20th century author and theologian, has said, even atheists have their moments of doubt. I think my step-cousin came closer to believing that day than any other time. It's not until we come to the end of our own resources, our own abilities, often, it's then that we wait to turn to God and say, where are you? He's present even in the middle of our storm. The disciples thought they could handle this on their own. They let Jesus sleep. Why? Well, they were fishermen. They knew how to navigate boats. He was a mere carpenter. But finally, they come to him. It says in verse 25, and they said, save us. We are perishing. Matthew is a little bit more generous in his recollection of the situation than Mark. Mark records them as saying, Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? But either way, he's present in the middle of our storm. You see, it wasn't the storm 
And it isn't our storm that rattles him, that awakens him, but it is our cry for help that does get his attention. Which leads me to the fourth observation, and that is not only is he present in our storm, but he's greater than our storm. Matthew records Jesus asking them a theological question before he takes action. Verse 26, why are you afraid, you men of little faith? <laughs> and that's the main point of this passage. Where are we in our faith in the Lord God in the middle of our storm? When we get sick with COVID, when we lose our job, when whatever the storm, the crisis is, where are we in our trust and confidence in Him? Whatever your crisis is, here's what Jesus is saying to them. Have you no faith? I'm going to get you to the other side. But do you not believe? I'm with you. All. I like the way Isaiah the prophet from the Old Testament says it. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, Isaiah says, When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. The psalmist says it this way in Psalm 91. He starts with, in verse 1, The person who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And he goes on later to say, Because that person has loved me, I will therefore deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in the time of trouble and I will honor him. Where is your faith? And then it says, verse 26, Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind and the sea and it became perfectly calm. We saw earlier the humanity of Jesus in this passage. He was tired. He needed sleep. Now we see the deity of Jesus in the same passage. He has authority and power even over the weather. It's been two millennia since then. We still haven't figured that out, right? This is the deity of Jesus. That he rebuked the wind and the sea, that's the word that's used here, says to me, he doesn't cause the storms of life, but he allows them. He's not the author of the storms of life, but he uses them. And you might ask, well, how is that, Greg? It is in the storms of life that we discover how much faith we have and how much faith we lack. And these guys literally were fearing for their life. So much so that Jesus says, where is your faith? He rebukes the wind and the sea. And what is the result? It is a building of their faith. That's what the storms of life are to do for us. Verse 27, they were amazed. And they said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? See, our faith isn't tested, it isn't strengthened, it isn't matured. It isn't something that is proven in the time of calm. No, our faith is both challenged as well as revealed as well as deepened in its roots when the storms of life come and we turn to God and we see the work of God and we experience His power. I like the way Paul says it as he writes to the church in Philippi. Paul, as he writes to the church in Philippi, he says, 
You know, our relationship with the Lord is something that gives us a peace that you just can't describe it. It goes beyond comprehension. It goes beyond understanding. Hebrews 11, chapter 1, describes what faith really is. You see it there on the screen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Notice what it does not say. It does not say faith is the substance of things we already have. Uh, That's not faith. That's knowledge. Faith is the substance of things we hope for haven't yet experienced. It's not the evidence of things we understand. No, it's the evidence of things we don't understand and we don't see. So, yeah, 2020, (laughs) it's been a year like no other. But it's the cruise of a lifetime. And I invite you, climb aboard. It's a cruise you will never forget, but it's a cruise you will never regret. So I leave you with this from Jude chapter 1. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, and dominion, and authority before all time and evermore. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand up and sing with us the old hymn that I'm sure many of you have sung many times before about a gentleman uh, that was written by a gentleman that went through the storms of life, as many of us are doing right now. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows
would help us not just sing that today, but to live it out. We still have a few weeks of this year, and it's been a hard one. And God, there's no guarantee that 2021 won't have its difficulties, but Lord, I pray that you would help us live it out every day, one day at a time. It is well with our souls. We love you, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Let's go out to serve the Lord. God bless you.